Welcome back, this is Chris and my brother in Christ, Stephen, and Welcome. my sister in Christ, Lynn. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and it's uh, May 21st, Year of Our Savior, 2022. And the title of this video is a continuation called Astronaut Part 3. Yes, Astronaut Part 3. It reminds me of that, what was that show with uh, Dan Aykroyd? Cone Heads. Cone Heads. <laughs> <laughs> what they say, you're like, to the moon, ha! <laughs> or something like that. I forgot that. Uh, anyway, my mind shifts and goes all over the place. All right, so continuing here, we're learning about the astronauts, and there are astronauts have been under um, uh, surveillance, and some of them have actually been killed. Um, let's talk about Gus Grissom, all right? Shortly before Grissom died, he hung a large lemon on the Apollo space capsule as the press looked on, thus graphically indicating um, his opinion of the space capsule. Grissom, along with fellow astronauts Ed White and Roger Chaffee, was shortly thereafter immolated inside a test capsule when it burst into flames as it sat on the launch pad during a test. During the test and before the fire, there was a communication failure. Grissom is recorded saying at that time, quote, how are we going to get to the moon when we can't communicate between two buildings, end quote. Grissom's opinion that the Apollo mission was doomed to failure was based upon his close study and examination of the mission rocket and other equipment. He took detailed notes and wrote reports about his findings. The day Grissom died on the launch pad, FBI agents burst into Grissom's home and seized all of his records. Grissom's wife reports that those records were never returned. The fire on the launch pad took place on January 27, 1967 at 6.30 p.m. Go ahead, my brother. And sister? <clears throat> Gus Grissom and Apollo astronauts murdered in 1967, hard evidence confirms. Astronaut Gus Grissom was murdered by NASA. Apollo astronaut was murdered. Sun charges Christopher, Rudy, Newsmax, Virgil One. Gus Grissom, the astronaut slated to be the first <coughs> man to walk on the moon, was murdered. His son has charged in the February 16 edition of Star Magazine. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, yeah, his son actually was able to prove that it was rigged. What's interesting is um, you had, uh, um, what was it? You had, uh, so right after he dies, yeah, my brother. It's interesting. Gus said they can't talk to each other from one building to the next, and yet Nixon supposedly talked to him when they were on the moon on the with moon. no time delay. Yeah, no time with delay. No, with no, you know, yeah. no time delay at all. Mm. Kind of now interesting. You can't get a cell phone reception out here in this country somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting, isn't it? Um, so we see that um, uh, the threats reviewed, uh, Christopher Ruddy of Newsmax revealed that before his death, Grissom had received death threats, which his family believed emanated from within the space program. The threats were viewed as so serious that Grissom was put under Secret Service protection and had been moved from his house to a secure safe house. Grissom's wife states that Grissom told her that, quote, if there is ever a serious accident in the space program, it's likely to be me, right? So pastors, be careful when you yoke yourself to NASA because NASA also kills people, all right? So let's continue here. We have uh, Thomas Barron testify before Congress regarding the deaths of Grissom, White, and Caffrey and gave critical testimony about improper actions and irregularities at NASA. NASA tried to discredit Barron's testimony before Congress, but to no avail. Barron was a meticulous investigator and he had the documented evidence. One example of NASA's effort to discredit Barron happened after Barron testified to an interview he conducted with Marvin Holmberg, who he told who told him that the astronauts apparently sensing the danger they're in tried to get out of the capsule five minutes before the capsule burst into flames. 
NASA apparently persuaded Holmberg that his revelation to Barron was imprudent. When Holmberg was called to testify before Congress, he suddenly changed the story and denied that he had ever told Barron that the astronauts tried to get out of the capsule. Barron's 500-page report mysteriously disappeared, and to this day it has never been found. Bar NASA failed to discredit Barron before Congress and they could not allow him to repeat what he knew to the press. All criminal organizations know that dead men tell no tales. Within a week after his congressional testimony, Barron, his wife, and his stepdaughter were killed when his car allegedly stalled at a railroad crossing and was struck by a train. Yeah. Contrary to Florida law, no autopsy was performed. All three bodies were quickly cremated, thus ensuring that any foul play would not be discovered. Oh, pastors, you love your NASA. You want to quote NASA above the living word of God, don't you, right? So continuing, yeah, his son Scott Grissom clearly proved that, you know what they did, didn't they? Um, oh, let me continue. This is really interesting. Um, we have engineers, <laughs> NASA engineers knew full well the dangers in which they're putting Grissom, White, and Caffrey. Um, NASA had previously commissioned a report by Dr. Emanuel M. Roth, which was published in 1964. Renee states that, quote, Dr. Roth cites difficulties with 100% oxygen atmospheres even under low pressures. Any competent engineer should have known the dangers of oxygen at 16.7 or 20.2 psi. The pressure of the oxygen in the capsule Grissom, uh, Grissom White, and Caffrey were in. Interesting. NASA not only ignored their own tests, on pure low pressure oxygen but up the ante by increasing the pressure above atmospheric. Pure oxygen ladies and gentlemen is highly highly flammable. Mm -hmm. All you need is some, I mean stuff will, stuff that doesn't even have a spark, gasoline can literally be caught on fire because of the pressure of pure oxygen. NASA knows this. So we see Rene revealed, Rene is Ralph Rene in his book, NASA Mooned America. Uh, Rene revealed one example of the dangerousness of oxygen that resulted in two men being killed at a U.S. government facility. A terrible accident took place on January 1st, 1967, approximately three weeks before Grim, uh, Grissom, Caffrey, and White were burned to death. Quote, two men were handling 16 rabbits in a chamber of 100% oxygen at 7.2 psi at Brooks Air Force Base, and all living things died in the inferno. That's 7.2. They were up to 16.7 or 20.2 psi. The pressure in the capsule that Grimson, White, and Caffrey were in was cranked up to between 16.7 and 20.2 psi. Experts call pure oxygen put under pressure oxygen bombs. That's exactly what it was, an oxygen bomb. Because pure oxygen is exponentially more dangerous when put under pressure. While under pressure, combustible materials can spontaneously explode into flames because of the heat generated by rapid oxida oxidation. The obsolete space capsule that was being tested by uh, Grissom, White, and Caffrey was full of combustible materials. At a pressure between 16.7 and 20.2 psi, any spark would cause the oxygen to explode and immediately immolate any living thing in the capsule, just as happened, right? Now, Scott Grimson was able to go back into that capsule, which was still there, and he found a ignition device. Also, what they did is the door normally goes outward, right? If you look at most public buildings, they all open outward. Not talking about your house. 
Remember those barn doors? Remember originally they opened inward, there's so much pressure, they had a fire going on, everybody burned inside. So now they have all the barn doors opening outward. Well, what happened is they switched the door so the door went inward. It had to open inward. So they're trying to get out. It's pressurized. It has all this pressure. Then they got ignition, and these people were murdered by NASA. So you pastors, don't you be quoting me, this murderous organization, as your God and authority. Shame on you. And shame on you calling us dumb and stupid, you're at hominems, because we want to preach the Word of God, specifically out of Moses. All right. Well, let's continue, right? Oh, so much stuff going on. All right. But Houston, Houston, we got a problem, ladies and gentlemen. We have a problem. See, the charlatan Christian pastors and create creation scientists, uh, shills rely heavily on NASA and other national space agencies for their doctrine. They reject the biblical model of a fixed flat earth because NASA rejects the model of a fixed and flat earth. But NASA is not really a space agency. It is an agent, it is an intelligence agency that spews religious dogma cloaked in scientific jargon. The religious charlatans simply parrot the party line. Houston, we have a problem as a popular rendition of a statement made over the radio from Apollo 13 moon mission astronaut Jack uh, Swigert and the NASA Mission Control Center at Houston, Texas, right? But <clears throat> continuing here, from time to time, NASA and the other space agencies must adjust their dogma or their doctrine to conceal the conflict between their religious doctrine and true science. For example, on February 20th, 2019, the European Space Agency, abbreviated ESA, announced a discovery that the moon is within the Earth's atmosphere. What? <laughs> the Earth now is within, the moon is now within the Earth's atmosphere. Well, I don't understand, why did, why did they need spacesuits then? If they could breathe the Earth's atmosphere. Exactly. Interesting. Quote, the moon uh, flies through Earth's atmosphere, says Igor Balakin of Russia's Space Research Institute, leader, lead author of the paper presenting the results. The space agencies are not saying that the moon is close to the Earth. They are saying that the Earth's atmosphere encompasses a distant moon. That discovery was alleged by the European Space Agency to be based upon data that came from the ESA slash NASA spacecraft known as the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory called SOHO. The SOHO data allegedly quote shows that the gaseous layer that wraps around Earth reaches up to 391,000 miles away or 50 times the diameter of our planet, end quote. ESA explains that the, quote, at outermost part of our planet's atmosphere extends well beyond the lunar orbit, almost twice the distance to the moon. So now, yeah, they just make stuff up. But this is the pastor's authority, is NASA in the ESA. Just, just printed, and uh, they said this in 2019. Well, the suspicious thing about the announcement is that the SOHO data was obtained more than 20 years ago. ESA's explanation for the delay was that, quote, we were not aware of it until we dusted off observations made over two decades ago by the SOHO spacecraft, end quote. Can't make this stuff up. That explanation is incredible. In fact, no such data exists because there is no SOHO and there is no outer space. Yes, there is no outer space, pastors. You should get into the living Word of God. Remember, there is only heaven and earth according to the gospel, the God spell, the oracles of God. The established dogma, dogma of science is that there is no atmosphere in space. And there is no atmosphere around the moon. Outer space is always portrayed as a black void. 
a perfect vacuum. There is no atmosphere in space. Why are NASA and ESA suddenly coming up with this curious announcement that contradicts more than 50 years of space exploration propaganda? That is because space agencies have a physics problem with their premise of space travel using rockets in the vacuum of space. That problem is solved by the new discovery of the Earth's expansive atmosphere extending beyond the moon. NASA, the European Space Agency, ESA, and all space agencies have created a mythology of space travel based upon rockets in the vacuum of space. The problem the space agencies face is that people are becoming aware that rockets require a fulcrum to push to move against. On the earth, what do we have? The fulcrum is what? The ground? And then the atmosphere, right? That's, that, that's, what, that's what a plane requires when it lifts. All right, so space is supposed to be an empty vacuum. In a vacuum, there is nothing to act as a fulcrum for a rocket to push against. Also, you need air for ignition. Mm -hmm. Lynn, do you have something to say? No, I'm just thinking about what you're saying. Yeah. Things are running through my head. Yeah, it's really interesting, and this makes you think. So, well, that would be a rocket in a vacuum of space would be useless. But if the space agencies can introduce an atmosphere into outer space, that solves their problem. They can explain that the fulcrum upon which the rocket push is the expanded atmosphere that goes beyond the moon. Another problem space agencies have is the orthodox um, scientific model for radio communications. That scientific model excuse me, has painted the scientific community into a corner. The fact that long distance radio communications proves that the earth is flat with a firmament over it. The scientific community has come up with theories of radio communication that make no sense on a globular earth. The makeshift theories are so contradictory and impossible that they inexplicably suggest that there is no outer space and the earth must have a firmament over it. Yes, man, if they would only just believe the word of God, but they have to, they worship the God of this world and the God of this world, Satan has a counterfeit God's, a counterfeit cosmology to the word of God. So the distant moon within the expanded atmosphere explanation is a solution that ESA slash NASA has come up with to refute the inference that the earth is flat and covered by a firmament. Modern science has come up with several convoluted theories to explain long distance radio transmissions because they cannot allow it to be known that the earth is flat. The most prevalent theory is the ionosphere bounce theory. Under that mythology, radio operators can talk to people on the other side of the supposed spherical Earth, not because the Earth is flat, but because the radio signal bounces off the thin upper atmosphere called the ions ionosphere. Think about it logically. Under the ionosphere bounce theory, radio waves have no problem traveling through the atmosphere, but when the radio waves reach the thinnest part of the atmosphere, that is called the ionosphere, that those same radio waves bounce off that thin ionosphere and return to the Earth. That's nonsense, ladies and gentlemen. It has to be. The firmament, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Interesting. See, the firmament is the surface upon which long-distance radio transmission are bounced. The author explains this, right? All of this is explained in this book, ladies and gentlemen, and a lot of other books as well. It's called Physics as well. So we see that um, really interesting. Radio communications within the Apollo astronauts on the moon, well, if it's bouncing off, because how can it go around a globular Earth unless it bounces off the thinnest part of the atmosphere and bounces and goes around the ball. But somehow, they was able to go through the ionosphere and communicate with the astronauts that supposedly landed on the moon, right? 
So apparently they have like this, this toggle switch so they go, we're turning off the ionosphere. Okay, now we're gonna turn it on. We're gonna turn it off like a little snap switch. Doesn't make any sense. So it either bounces off the ionosphere or it goes through it. Interesting. So that's why they had to expand the atmosphere to go way beyond the moon. They just make things up. When it doesn't work out, they change their dogma. They change their doctrine. That's why God hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans because these pastors are not training their congregation to be subject to the Word of God. If they knew the Word of God, they can think for themselves and they can reason one with each other. All right. Indeed, under the orthodox theory of ionosphere balance, all radio communications with, with spacecraft anywhere in space would be impossible. Radio signals cannot bounce off and also pass through the ionosphere. You got to choose, NASA. You got to choose. It is that impossibility that has caused NASA and the ESA to come up with the mythology that the Earth's atmosphere reaches out to 300, 391,000 miles, which is approximately 152,100 uh, miles past the moon. And it wouldn't get hot when it's coming back in the atmosphere yeah. if they're coming from the moon because the atmosphere is right there. That's right. It's all the same. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the plot thickens. Oh, it does. But the pastors, man, they just want to quote NASA and they just they, they add homonyms. They call us stupid moronic because we believe the book of Moses. It's incredible. All right. Well, we see Elizabeth Howell writing for Space.com explains the generally accepted scientific theory that, quote, Earth's magnetic field and atmospheric shields the planet from 99.9% .9 of radiation from space. That scientific theory, that's end quote. That scientific theory poses a problem from the mythology of the moon being 238,900 uh, 238, miles away in outer space. Modern scientific theory has the Earth's atmosphere acting as a giant Faraday cage to protect the Earth from the allegedly dangerous radiation made up of gamma rays and X-rays and cosmic rays. There is no agreement among scientists whether cosmic radiation is made up of electromagnetic waves or subatomic particles. NASA categorizes cosmic rays as part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Just below cosmic rays on the electromagnetic spectrum are gamma rays and X-rays. Radio waves are also considered electromagnetic rays. Waves. Everybody who has, a, has had medical or dental uh, x-rays knows that they are dangerous, right? And typically vital organs are covered by a lead shield. This went to the dentist. Guess what they laid across my chest, right? A lead apron, right? Or a lead, uh, um, I don't know, blanket or whatever. The x-ray technician will usually stand behind a lead line wall when activating, and I've seen them. I've worked in an x-ray room, it's lead. And it only goes so high because it was, I think it was about five feet high because x-rays go in a straight line. So activating the x-ray machine, that is done because it is understood that the atmosphere is no barrier to x-rays. So it's no barrier to x-rays, interesting. But modern scientists would have us believe that the same atmosphere that offers no impediment to x-rays in a medical facility magically becomes an impenetrable barrier when the x-rays are trying to reach Earth from outer space. It is impossible for the atmosphere to block x-rays. That means that there cannot be any x-rays coming from outer space. Indeed, x-rays cannot emanate from outer space because there is no outer space. If Earth's atmosphere is actually able to block dangerous gamma rays, X-rays, and cosmic rays, supposedly bombarding Earth from outer space, it can certainly block radio waves. How could astronauts seemingly in outer space and even on the moon use electromagnetic radio waves to communicate through that purportedly impenetrable atmospheric shield to NASA mission control back on Earth? 
Wow. The scientific community does not have a good explanation. Well, imagine that. For the radio signal anomaly for how the Earth's atmosphere can block gamma rays, x-rays, and cosmic rays, but it cannot block radio waves. They contradict themselves when they say that the atmosphere or ionosphere can in fact block and reflect radio waves back to Earth when, tra when they travel toward the Earth. Well, at the same time, NASA has no problem with radio waves passing through allegedly impenetrable ionosphere as they supposedly communicate with, a with astronauts in outer space. So it bounces off the ionosphere and goes around the globe, but then it doesn't bounce and it goes through the thinnest part of the atmosphere and communicate with the astronauts. And Nixon uh, supposedly could communicate with the astronauts 200 something thousand miles away. With no delay. With no delay. Hmm. But I have a problem with my cell phone. Mm -hmm. I do too. Out in the country. Interesting, right? But hey, right, it's NASA. They would never lie to you, right? They would never murder people. They would never bug. It's, it's, a, it's an intelligence agency, ladies and gentlemen. So why does the scientific community have an illogical and opposing theories? Because the high priests of science needed the ionosphere bounce phenomena to explain long distance radio communications on the supposed spherical Earth. And at the same time, they need to allow for radio communications from Earth with astronauts who are supposedly to be in outer space. The new paradigm constructed by the expanded atmosphere that extends beyond the moon solves the problem of heretofore scientific community uh, construct that has the atmosphere nonsensically both blocking radio waves and conducting radio waves at the same time. Wow, talk about science fiction. So it's just, you know, it's on, it's, it's off, it's bouncing, now we switch it on, it's going through the ionosphere. You want to believe that, pastors, go ahead. But as for us, we're going to believe the living word of God. God bless you. Thank you. Bye.